good afternoon and welcome everyone to our um, COVID consent and care planning webinar. This is part of a series of webinars which we are um, which we've created to deal with topics we've been asked to cover by our clients in relation to the pandemic and the associated legal issues. My name is Jennifer Hobbington and I'm a senior solicitor in the healthcare litigation team here at Hempson's. I'm joined today by Elspeth Rose, who is from our healthcare advisory team. And um, just in terms of a bit of housekeeping. With regards to the procedure today, um, I understand the majority of you are listening and watching via video, but we do have a number dialing in. And um, please, can I ask everyone to make sure that they're muted so that we don't get any feedback? Um, and um, just to make everyone aware, the um, webinar today is being recorded. For those that are on the phone, we do have some slides which we will be referring to as part of the presentation. However, please don't worry about not being able to see these. And um, they just set out some links to some useful resources which we'll refer to. Um, our aim is not to be slaves to the PowerPoint, so um, we won't be referring to them uh, too much. And we can send you a copy of the slides following today's session. The plan is that Elspeth and I will work our way through a number of connected topics in discussion with each other. We are hoping to have time for questions, so please do use the, um, the question tab um, to, to put your questions to us as we go along. Um, depending on how we're doing, we might pause here and there to review the questions as we go along. Um, but please do be assured that if we don't get to your question today, then um, please feel free to email Elspeth or I after the session. And um, our contact details are on the slides at the end of the slides, um, and we'll be happy to deal with any questions. Now, with regards to the agenda, today we're going to be covering consent, um, capacity issues and um, advanced care planning. These issues are all tied in with each other um, and have been the subject of a number of queries we've had in recent months in relation to coping with COVID. So, yes, we will also have access to the recording that will be sent round um, after the session today. We want to um, explain, we don't want to state the obvious. Obviously, Jen and I have not provided care on the front line um, like many of you, but obviously we see the legal queries and claims that come in and how those interact with the developments with regards to the legislation and case law, which has come about as a result of the pandemic. So this is what we're gonna focus on today um, and we'll discuss the legal ramifications um, that you may experience further down the line and because I'm coming from the advisory team so I um, my, part of my practice is in relation to the Mental Capacity Act and Court of Protection and as Jen deals with clinical negligence claims hopefully together we can bring you a different um, perspective on the issues and manage any questions that you have between us. Great so moving on to um, consent. Um, I suppose the first point to make is that it's really a case of additional responsibilities, not different responsibilities. Would you agree with that, Elspeth? Yes. So the usual considerations apply that everyone I'm sure will be familiar with. And by that, I mean that consent is a process. So it's a back and forth between the patient and clinician um, where information is shared and the options are discussed. I would describe it as um, being on a spectrum, not a binary issue. So by that, I mean that the more significant the intervention, the more sophisticated the consent process needs to be and the more information that would need to be conveyed. And the level of information should be appropriate to the circumstances, but also tailored to the individual patient and their needs um, precisely, which I think brings us, Jen, to um, a case of Montgomery that you're going to talk about. Yeah, I appreciate that um, you will all be aware of the Montgomery case, which was heard in the Supreme Court in 2015. And um, this case departed from the previously well established principles, which favoured more of a medical paternalistic approach and instead now places um, particular emphasis on patient autonomy. Montgomery um, defined the test of materiality in terms of the, the risks which need to be explained to the patient. And this is essentially a, a two limb test. Um, which is based on the reasonable person with consideration of a particular patient. So what would um, a reasonable person in that patient's position um, be likely to attach significance to the risk? So the options must be presented side by side and the relative risks and benefits of the different treatment options should be discussed with the patient. 
Clinicians shouldn't make assumptions regarding the wishes of the patient or what they might perceive as the best option available. They shouldn't assume that the patient has the same set of values or wishes or priorities as they would have in that situation. Um, and whilst the doctor might think that the disclosure of certain information could lead the patient to a decision that's not in their best interests, as was true in the Montgomery case, um, the ethical and legal position is clear. Doctors must not withhold information simply because they disagree with the decision the patient is likely to make if they're given that information. But it is true to say that under the pandemic, things obviously have changed significantly. And so in terms of the, the hurdles, there's so much more done remotely. We have to consider social distancing, PPE. Um, and so that back and forth between the patient and clinician in order to establish that consent and informed consent has now a number of additional obstacles to navigate. I think if anyone's um, joining in, welcome. Um, if you could put yourselves on mute, that would be fab. Um, so there is guidance out there. Um, again, we'll, we've we've got links on the slides as to how to conduct virtual consultations and the pitfalls to avoid. Um, and this obviously goes to the process of obtaining consent. But Jen, you've mentioned materiality and Montgomery. So how does that affect it in these circumstances? Yeah, there's considerable changes to the core information which has to be communicated of the process. Um, clinicians would now have to have to consider um, increased risk because of COVID. Now that can be both in terms of a patient's own treatment and the increased yeah. risk of infection, or it could um, include consideration of whether someone's at an increased risk of um, getting or becoming severely ill um, with COVID. For example, um, as we all know, um, patients of a certain age, um, maybe a, a particular gender, or if they're from um, a Black, Asian or other minority ethnic group, are um, at a higher risk of developing COVID. There also might be impacts on the timeframes um, that the treatment can be provided um, under, and this could be affected by COVID. And there also might be considerations in terms of isolation, both before and after the treatment. There could be increased responsibilities in terms of preparing for the, um, the particular treatment to be undertaken and in respect of recovery. It also um, might need to be considered um, whether there are impacts on the, the patient's working or living arrangements. So will these increase the risk of, of exposure and what measures are possible um, to be put in place to minimise this risk? Um, nice produced rapid guidelines um again the links in the slides but for reference it's ng179 so this is published in july updated in august of this year and it includes a one-page visual summary which supports the decision making process when arranging planned care like elective surgery or interventional procedures diagnostics and imaging for instance and so that's that's really helpful and i recommend having a quick look um, and digesting that. Um, but I think a really interesting aspect of um, whether the consent discussion should include information about how we'd normally treat something um, different from the options currently being presented. What, what, what are your views, Jen, in relation to that? Yeah, I think it is a really interesting um, issue, this, Elspeth, because be before the pandemic, when applying Montgomery and considering the, um, the reasonable alternative treatment options, a distinction was made between uh, appropriate treatment and possible treatment. There was a, a 2017 case, the case of Bailey and George Elliott Hospital, um, in which the claimant suffered from a, a post-thrombotic syndrome um, following a DVT after giving birth. And it was alleged in that case that the defendant NHS Trust had negligently failed to inform the claimant of experimental treatment option, which was only potentially available in a few centres in Europe. Now, the court found that a reasonably competent vascular surgeon operating in 2008, which was when the claimant was treated in this case, um, wouldn't have been aware of the possibility of this um, venous stenting procedure as an alternative treatment. There was no evidence that this treatment was being performed in the UK. And as such, the stenting procedure, whilst being possible treatment in parts of the world, wasn't considered appropriate treatment option, um, which the claimant should have been told about in order to obtain her informed consent. 
But I think the issue at present is that some of the previously appropriate treatment options are no longer possible because of, for example, limitation on resources as a result of the pandemic. And so the question will be is whether to only inform the patient of the appropriate options which are available or whether to also inform the patient of the um, appropriate treatment options which are currently available, uh, sorry, currently not available or not possible. So Putting it into these circumstances, if a treatment's not possible because of COVID restrictions, does it need to be mentioned? So if you'd usually offer um, surgery or an invasive investigative procedure but can't offer it due to measures to limit the infection, are you obliged to include these in consent discussions to protect yourself from a claim? I think... There's certainly arguments in favour of not including this in the consent discussions. Um, for example, the fact that the existing case law doesn't require this information about treatments um, that aren't available. But, but that's more in respect of, of new treatments, for example, that haven't been approved. And there is the consideration that telling a patient about a treatment option, which would usually be available, but which isn't currently um, possible, could lead to significant distress. It also doesn't help the patient to weigh up the options, which is obviously the, the point of the consent process. Um, and it can put the clinician in a difficult position in that um, patients obviously can't demand a particular treatment option if it's not currently available or possible. Um, Montgomery did include a therapeutic exception, which um, allows um, information which is significantly detrimental to the health of the patient to be omitted. But I think in cases um, which we are seeing during the, the pandemic, it's going to be difficult to establish that the risk of disclosing the alternative um, non-available treatment was so great that non-disclosure was justified. And um, therefore, I think on balance, um, appropriate treatment options which are currently not available because of the pandemic should be discussed as part of the consent process with an explanation as to why they're currently unavailable. I, I agree with that. Um, because there's a number of factors in favour of this. I mean, a reasonable alternative, in my view, would be um, maybe to wait until that service resumes again. So um, a patient may be able to make a choice between the a second best treatment now and the best treatment at an unspecified date in the future. Now, of course, um, it goes without saying that discussion of the impact and potential risk of a delay would need to be um covered but that option um may need to still be be there in and involved in the the discussion and the consent process and ultimately it goes to having an open and honest approach um with your patients which i think is in line with the guidance isn't it jen yeah, absolutely. Um, there is guidance that's been produced by the professional bodies in respect to this matter, which we've referenced on the slides, um, for example, from the GMC and the Royal College of Surgeons. And um, the, the case law in Montgomery, in effect, brought the, the position in line with the guidance that's been in place from these bodies um, for quite some time. So really, in summary of um, the consent process, um, it, the key professional responsibilities and ethical principles remain the same um, and uh, notwithstanding the, the pandemic, but of course COVID has served to provide additional responsibilities and practical difficulties. Is that a fair summary from a ClinNeg perspective, Jen? Yeah, and I think um, in terms of the claims um, that, that we will see, um, we definitely will see claims associated with COVID and we are starting to see a few claims coming through. This is inevitable, but the issue is always going to boil down to was there a breach of duty? So would no reasonable body of medical professionals support the care provided? And if that's established then and the breach resulted in loss or injury to the patient, then the, the patient will be entitled to compensation. And um, similarly, the principles of Montgomery will still be applied in terms of considering whether there, um, there was informed consent of the procedure. Um, in terms of the kind of cases that we're seeing, um, for example, um, we've, we've seen one case where as a result of negligent treatment by the hospital, the patient um, required transfer to a nursing home for respite care where she developed COVID and died. 
so but for the negligence she would have been fit to have been discharged home and so wouldn't have died when she did and in that case um, it's likely that negligence would be established alternatively um for example if a patient was discharged to a care home and there was no negligent care involved and the patient subsequently developed COVID, passed this to her husband and he died. Um, arguably from the trust perspective, there was no duty of care to the husband and there was no breach of duty on which to base the negligence. So liability will not be established in that circumstance. So really um, much of it will depend on the circumstances and, and in particular the chain of events following the alleged negligence. And I've, I've, I've seen in many articles, and I'm sure um, delegates will have also seen, um, a suggestion of a new standard of care um, in, in the pandemic. Are we operating in, I suppose, a parallel universe where there's the second and different standard of care, Jen, in your, your view? I appreciate there has been discussion about this, Elspeth, in terms of whether the COVID pandemic will create, in effect, a new standard of care, or, or in fact, whether there should be um, a blanket immunity for all clinical negligence claims arising out of COVID-related matters, um, which I believe has been introduced in some states in the US. I think in terms of whether there should be a blanket immunity, whilst there are arguments in favour, um, for example, such as the fact that healthcare professionals have made many personal and professional sacrifices during the pandemic, and so arguably they shouldn't have to face the threat of clinical negligence claims arising from this period hanging over them for several years to come, whilst we see the effects of the, of the pandemic play out. But I think there are strong arguments against this. Um, I don't actually believe a blanket immunity is, is necessary. Um, any claims um, for, for clinical negligence will be brought against the hospital rather than the doctors personally. And I think having a blanket immunity sends the wrong message to patients, um, in effect saying that they're not entitled to proper care and it, it could potentially lead to a drop in the standard of care. Um, ultimately, if, if the care provided falls below the expected standard and is found to be negligent, then the patient is entitled to be compensated. So in terms of whether we'll see a new standard of care, ultimately, I don't think so, no. Um, the standard of care will remain as set out in Bolam and in Montgomery in respect of consent. Um, I believe the application of the law is flexible enough to allow for a reasonable interpretation in the time of a pandemic. And um, so whilst the care provided will be obviously judged against and um, whether it can be supported by a reasonable body of, of professionals acting um, within that discipline, then the courts will be able to take into account the fact that those um, professionals were acting in a highly um, pressured situation in terms of their um, the service they were provided during the pandemic and the claimant will ultimately still have the burden of proof. So that's sort of a whistle stop tour of um, consent but does anyone have any questions at this stage in particular I'm aware um, people on the phones um, can't see so it, it, they might think of a question now as opposed to being able to write in the chat box so please speak up if you have any questions or even um, any sort of examples that you want to share with the group at this stage. But if not, um, we'll move on to discussing capacity. Thanks, Elspeth. Um, so in terms of capacity, there has been emergency legislation brought in by, uh, sorry, in relation to the pandemic, um, which is the Coronavirus Act. And this introduced um, amendments and special rules in relation to a number of legislative provisions, including the Care Act and the Mental Health Act. Um, have there been any amendments to the Mental Capacity Act 2005? So there haven't been any amendments, so that's important. So the usual provisions will continue to apply. And those key principles are essentially that a person's assumed to have capacity unless it's established that they lack capacity. Um, all practicable steps must be taken to assist someone to make their own decision. And an unwise decision doesn't automatically equate to a lack of capacity. Um, any act done under the Capacity Act must be in the individual's best interests and must be the least restrictive option taken with regards to restricting that person's rights and freedom of action. In relation to the capacity assessment, um, the two part test still remains. So you first have uh, the clinical aspect, which is that there's an impairment of the mind um, 
and then due to that there's the functional test which means that a person's unable to make a decision um, in the fact that they can uh, they're unable to understand, retain, use and weigh up the relevant information, the pros and cons, and communicate their decision by talking or other means. So that remains the same. Best interest as ever, there's a um, checklist there and there's always um, the importance about an individual's wishes, beliefs, um, previous voice uh, wishes and views of their family or friends and also taking into account any advanced decisions or um, legal power of attorneys. So if someone's previously refused treatment or um, has made an advanced decision in that respect or has appointed someone um, in a, a decision-making proxy role, all of those remain the same. Um, but again, as we discussed with the consent issues, the guidance documents that have been produced, although don't change the, the premise, they do discuss the additional responsibilities and the, the actual difficulties people will encounter brought about by the pandemic. Um, dare I ask, um, Elspeth, what about dolls? <laughs> the lovely dolls that I'm sure everyone's delighted by. So um, for those that aren't aware, um, the dolls process deprivation of liberty safeguards. So it's a process by which the care management of individuals without capacity is authorised when that care amounts to a deprivation of liberty. And by the case law, that means that an individual is subject to continuous supervision and control and they're not free to leave permanently. So they would be stopped from leaving. Um, in terms of inpatient care, um, COVID hasn't necessarily um, affected this too much or made this more difficult um, because the case law is quite clear that if the treatment is materially the same as it would be given to a patient without a mental disorder, so someone with capacity, then this won't amount to a deprivation of liberty and so therefore you won't need to seek the appropriate authorization by the court. So in simple terms this means if the root cause of a loss of liberty is a physical condition as opposed to mental condition, then the restrictions imposed will not meet that um, test that then needs to, um, that then the court needs to authorise that deprivation. Saying that, there are deprivations of liberty which do, of course, arise and they need to be processed. And people who are used to the dolls um, process will know that it is extremely clunky and awkward. Um, there is a shortened, more urgent way of processing um, dolls applications, but they they're still it's still not um, an ideal scenario. And those who deal with sort of uh, the dolls process know that you have to collate a huge amount of information to evidence um, best interests lack of capacity, least restrictive option, et cetera. And then this um, information uh, gets sent to the court and put before a judge to be sanctioned. So that was a lot of talking, I'm afraid. <laughs> Sorry, yeah, we've put a number of these um, guidance documents on the slides. Um, Elspeth, could you just pick out the, the key points for us? Yes, yeah, so in terms of um, reams of guidance, essentially it's looking at um, the best way to collate the capacity evidence in difficult scenarios. So it details, for instance, how to carry out remote capacity assessments via video link, um, how you can look at previous uh, capacity assessments, although I will flag that you have to be careful that this background information um, doesn't go against the presumption of capacity. There is still a need for a contemporaneous assessment and the capacity assessments need to be decision and time specific. So this goes towards the, the, the picture um, and the background, but it isn't to be used instead of a current capacity assessment. So most of the guidance relates to assessment in the community, but it's clear that it supports creative and pragmatic approaches as to how capacity assessments are carried out. 
I think an interesting point that, that maybe um, some of the, the people attending today will, will have come across is in relation to testing um, someone for COVID who lacks the relevant mental, mental capacity and so they don't have the consent, so the ability to provide their consent. Yes, there is a lot of guidance on that, understandably. So the key points for that are that you need to take all practicable steps uh, to support the person to make the decision by themselves. And that's that's a standard practice that everyone um, will know about. If a best interest decision is necessary um, because this individual's um, refusing, then it needs to be on the individual spaces and circumstances. So everything is always, you know, individual person specific and no assumptions should be made. Um, so the guidance does say that for many people, a best interest decision to test for COVID will align with the decision that we could have expected the person to have taken themselves if they had capacity. So it's reasonable to conclude that most people leaving hospital for a care home would have agreed to testing for the protection of their own health and others around them. So there's a bit of uh, pragmatism uh, applied here. But what about the scenario um, in which a person without capacity refuses either to take the test or they will not or cannot follow the necessary um, safety precautions? So to deal with this scenario, there's emergency provisions under the Coronavirus Act, which does set out powers um, under which patients can be detained and screened when they're non-compliant. But these powers, understandably, because they're, they're e extreme, are ex exercisable by police officers and public health officers. And so if these powers were needed, the public health officer um, can authorise the detention of an individual for the purposes of testing and containing the risk of infection. But the local health protection team that will be arranging this will want to know that all the viable options have been exhausted that are available under the um, Capacity Act and uh, Mental Health Act. So essentially our first port, port of call is always the original legislation and um, Mental Capacity Act and um, Mental Health Act as our, as our starting point. And um, I appreciate again a lot of information all at once but does anyone have any questions at this stage or any insight as to dealing with um, obtaining um, capacity and doing capacity assessments in community or in hospital. Uh, Elspeth, just to say we had uh, two people raise their hand. So we've ah. got um, Phil Hesketh um, and Dominic Bray. So, um, yes, uh, I did raise my hand earlier. It was regard to um, something Jennifer said with regards to Bolham while she was. Um, does Bolham you know, in, in, in this day and age, sit comfortably within, you know, the principles of Montgomery. Um, you know, Bollum is really about the sort of body of professional men and the view that they might have, which might not be of a high standard, versus um, very individual, you know, significant material risk. Um, my understanding was that since... Chester and uh, Montgomery, that Bollum was very much uh, a thing of the past. Is that correct? Yeah, that, that, that's that's quite correct, correct there, Phil. I think Bollum is obviously, um, you know, it was a case in 1957. Um, things have moved on a lot since then. Um, and and Bollum is, is kind of your standard, um, you know, negligence test. But I think right. in, in terms of specifically considering um, consent issues, that the courts... Um, given the Montgomery cases and the cases that have come since then, um, the, the court will be much more focused on the, the, the patient autonomy um, rather, and therefore a move away from this medical paternalism, which was more of the approach adopted um, in the Bolam case. So, you know, courts will be looking at whether the patient was informed of the material risks and in terms of, of assessing materiality, it's whether the, the, the reasonable person in the patient's um, position would have attached significance to that risk. Yeah, yeah. so um, so it, it is a, a move away from, from looking at whether that care would have been supported by a responsible body of, of, of medical professionals, you know, be that orthopaedic surgeons or, um, you know, 
of the, the correct discipline providing the treatment is a lot more focused on um, now on um, well with, with that patient that particular patient um, have um, considered that risk to be material and therefore they should have been informed of that that risk. Yeah that's um, reassuring thanks Jennifer yeah. No problem. Um, Do we have another question as well? Hello. Oh hi. Hello it's Dominic here I'm the other question is, is this a good one? <laughs> Yes. Jump <laughs> Thank in. you very much. Um, I also put it in the chat. I'm a clinical psychologist uh, working with people with cancer and other physical health conditions. And I come across a fair few of them who say um, they really struggle with these consultations where someone has to read them chapter and verse about absolutely everything. And um, I'm aware that Montgomery has really sharpened that up. Although you did refer to the clause in Montgomery about the emotional harm to people. Um, so in, in a sense, um, what would a clinician need to do, uh, you know, when, I, when I'm kind of working with doctors and so forth, what would they need to do to safeguard themselves if a patient was adamant they did not want to go through all the terms and conditions and, and all the rest of it, they were get, refusing consent for that conversation? Um, you know, if, uh, this was particularly, it may be slightly alarmed when you said in the COVID era, you'd have to tell people, you know, this is what you could have had. Um, even though you can't have it now, you can have it down the line. Um, so wh where where do we stand in terms of advising colleagues on uh, how to have a tailor-made conversation with that person rather than purely being utterly defensive in case they get sued? Yeah, I appreciate the difficulty, uh, um, Dominic, that, that clinicians are in in that circumstance. Obviously, in terms of um, the Montgomery, it does allow for that therapeutic exception. And I think the, the way to deal with that would be to, um, to document, to make it really clear in the documentation that the clinician um, has had the discussion with the patient in terms of the level of information that they want to be made aware of. And if, if that patient says, you know, I don't want to be told of the risks, um, or you know, associated with, for example, with COVID, um, then you know, as long as, as that is, is clearly documented, then I think that that is, is, is the best way that um, a clinician can then protect themselves should um, you know, we, we see a, a potential claim down the line. Um, it, it is a difficult situation and, and I think all that clinicians can do is, is to try and tailor the, um, the advice as um, best they can to that patient's own needs and not to impose any of their own wishes and their own um, priorities uh, on, on the patient. Thanks, that's I, really I totally useful. Agree with yeah. that. That, that's really no useful because otherwise they, they could be equally sued for traumatising someone. <laughs> so it could yeah, be a real yeah. a deep blue sea situation. Yeah, at the end of the day, documentation it, it is the yeah. best way to, to protect Thank yourself. You. Great. Um, so, oh, I think we had another question there. Is, I'm just going to check the... Um, sorry, I'm just double-checking. No, uh, I think we're okay to, to, to move on. Um, yes, sorry, um, Jen, we just have a, a question from... Oh, Anne. sorry. Uh, could you also clarify whether where someone has a dolls in a care home and they develop COVID, test positive and are required to self-isolate isolate in their room for up to, up to 14 days in line with current NHS guidance, is a dolls review actually necessary or can there be or can this be carried out via the best interest process? So um, in terms of the dolls process and it, all the same principles still apply as before but I would suggest in this scenario um, there's it's uh, you still would carry out the dolls review but of course um, because it still needs to be sanctioned but I appreciate um, the importance is um, sort of the initial um, management of that individual. So as long as you document and, and do it via best interest, but also trying to involve, as you would anyway, um, all the individuals that are involved in the care so that it's it's clearly taking into account as much information as possible, then um, that would usually be sufficient. But of course, it is very much on a sort of case by case basis. Um, and they haven't specified um you know that there, there's not uh, lots of different scenarios that are outlined in in guidance to say 
um, like a flow chart as to what you should or should not do. But I would say on the whole, best interest process, um, if you document everything and incorporate um, wishes and feelings and it's the least restrictive, then would be um, appropriate in that scenario. Does that help, Anne? And I think, should we um, keep an eye on questions, but move on to advanced care planning in case that that um, leads to further questions that we can deal with at the end? Yes, great. Thanks, um, Elspeth. So um, this advanced care planning tends to be um, where we've had the most um, sort of COVID related queries, understandably. So we're adding this in. Um, it's it's without a doubt a useful tool because it allows um, individuals wishes about treatments um, to continue through to a time when they can no longer make um, contemporaneous decisions in that regard. Um, it helps to provide clarity to the treating teams and it can assist um, to protect a clinician from a complaint or a claim um, for instance where the family with the stated wishes of their loved one, which comes comes up more often than not. Um, and of course, with the pandemic, it takes on new importance. Um, there's obviously a huge rise in people wishing to set out their, their feelings if they do need treatment. And clinicians were urged to support robust care planning um, to deal with the, the need and supply um, so it could be appropriately measured and matched is that right Jen? Yeah but I've seen quite a large amount of negative attention around this issue Elspeth and um, so I've seen some stories about um, do not attempt cardiopulmonary resuscitation decisions so the DNA CPR um, seemingly unilaterally imposed on the basis of age or disability and Seems to have been much coverage about the emotional impact of advanced care planning from patients and their families who say that the early discussions about end of life care were, were too much in an, in an already unbearable situation. Um, as you say, the number of legal queries in relation to this has increased, but do you think it's potentially gone too far? Um, has its purpose been distorted such that um, perhaps its usefulness and its power have been diminished? Do you think that the troubling, there are troubling implications for life after the pandemic when, um, for example, decisions that have been made in the context of the emergency period may be held to apply in very different circumstances? From aspects of recent coverage, there appears to be, to be a real concern about um, advanced care planning, that it could do more harm than good. So I'm still strongly of the view that going back to basics, that um, advanced care planning is extremely important and useful um, and can take um, many forms if it's um, patient-led through an advanced decision or statement or via um, an appointed attorney or clinically driven um, with for instance like a do not resuscitate order and and of course all of these options come with procedural requirements um, which are not diluted because of the pandemic. But the essential factor is communication um, about the plan between the patient clinician um, and uh, indeed the patient's family. So if the patient's advanced decision to refuse treatment is not seen by a clinician, it will not inform uh, treatment options. Um, a clinician's opinion that a CPR would not a patient's best interest must be discussed with the patient or their loved one for it to be lawful. Um, this is obviously with the caveat, unless they refuse or there's a real risk of harm. So really the, the advanced care planning, the, the common denominator is that it can't be done unilaterally. Um, and if it is done unilaterally, either by the clinician or the patient, then it will not be effective and will not be lawful. So the key here clearly is about communication, regardless that we are in um, a pandemic. And of course, the care planning needs to be patient specific. Um, it's about the patient and must be thoroughly involving the patient, of course. So in that way, advanced care planning um, 
can do everything which it was initially tasked. So it can simultaneously act as a protector of the patient's rights and wishes, but also a shield for clinicians against a complaint or a claim. Um, and is, I, I believe, an essential tool for providers to ensure a comprehensive service. I, I totally appreciate that it's a difficult path to tread and difficult at the best of times and now made even more difficult with the challenges of social distancing, isolation and other considerations with resources. But it is still a path that I would say um, is advantageous for all those parties involved. And Elspeth, you brief, briefly touched on um, care management and resources. Is there anything else you can add in respect to this? So, yes. Yeah, so my colleague and partner in the team, Helen Claridge, um, she did a webinar about this earlier in the pandemic. And we have links um, to all the, the webinars and archived webinars on our website. So you'll be able to track this down and listen to um, at your leisure. But essentially, there's no clear national guidance. So um, there has been a lot of, which, which is probably and partly why there's been so much press about it, because there's no one clear um, model or consensus. Um, so there's, there's no national guidance as to how to um, triage patients um, in this scenario when we're potentially leading to an overwhelming of resources. But the Intensive Care Society have produced guidance. Again, it's included um, in our slides, which is a helpful document. And I'd recommend that trusts um, have a read of it in conjunction with their own processes for prioritisation um, and see how this accords with their guidance and have take some time to think about what decisions should be left um, to the treating doctor or whether different decisions need to be given to different levels of experience and responsibility. So, for instance, at consultant level or whether there needs an ethics panel in this matter. Great. So. Uh from my perspective, um, in terms of the summary of the issues that we've discussed today, I think it's fair to say that by and large, the legal principles are fundamentally the same. However, uh, the pandemic has brought significant practical difficulties and increased the burden um, in, in many ways. Yeah, so that is definitely my view of it as well. So I think it, it's worth adding that much of the guidance is focused on increased communication and patient liaison um, so drawing people together but of course and we've seen in in some of the comments um, that people have written um, at the moment that actually we're also being told to stay further apart and I think there's sort of a dichotomy and friction between them uh, between those two concepts yeah, I, I agree. And I think it's that friction that I suspect will lead to an increase in the, in the claims and complaints we see in the future. Um, in terms of practical advice, um, Elspeth, have you got have you got any pointers um, as to, to how to, to avoid that friction? I think, I mean, undoubtedly there are difficulties. And again, we've seen on the chat people um, explaining that it's difficult to do remote consultations and assessments and I'd, I entirely agree and understand, um, but the philosophy remains the same. It's just the way of doing it um, changes. And so they really, um, the guidance is focused on being quite flexible and imaginative um, as to ways to successfully communicate. Um, and, and so trying to um, make sure that we're actually um, engaging brain really when we're having these consultations and trying to make them as effective as possible but without a doubt it um, I do think you need um, more time because there's an increased number of obstacles responsibilities so I think starting the for instance the consent process early um, and I know that's not always possible but is a best case scenario um, because it it the more involvement and engagement will definitely help and smooth the the sort of journey and as you said documentation is king um as with everything whether you're looking at um assessment um of capacity issues 
um, in relation to doles and if you're making a best interest decision as opposed to going down the doles route and seeking sanctioning ultimately you do need your documentation to show that you've considered the options and um, and this is the best route forward um, it's important to explain how you did um, what you needed to do and what information and resources were available at the time so it's really building a picture to provide that context um, and and again ultimately documentation is the thing that will help you down the line yeah absolutely um i know we, we've had a few more questions and comments so i'm just going to go back to those um i i, I think um uh, Lupak has said, um, are there any issues with informed consent that's delivered by a video link? Um, are there any issues with confirming the ID of the patient? Um, as we've said, um, it, there are obviously going to be a lot of practical difficulties in terms of um, obtaining the consent of patients during the pandemic. But the consent process um, it, it is just that it's a process so that whilst um, it, the, this um, might have to initially start um, to be delivered via video link, then there is obviously going to become a, 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 a point when the, the patient has to attend the hospital um, for in person for their treatment and, and their ID can be confirmed um, at that stage. Also, I think that it's just um, the opportunity to be a, a bit more creative. It might um, involve maybe be writing to the patient, having things um, sent by email, just e exploring some other options that might not necessarily be considered um, at a time outside of a pandemic, but just to ensure that that, that process is, um, is as best, is completed as best as possible. Um, I think I think I, I... I can see another question in relation to um, what's the process for family members uh, to follow if they're unhappy with the outcome of a best interest meeting. In relation to that, um, uh, what I would say is a, a best interest meeting that documents all the wishes um, and views of everyone involved, including family members. Um, you know, they should the best. Uh, an effective best interest meeting and effective documentation should um, evidence all of the different viewpoints. And so if you can't reach a consensus, then that might be a scenario again, uh, fact specific where um, you sort of escalate it or speak to my team, but it might be something that then needs to go via um, a court sanctioned route. Um, it, so the there's that um, sign off and and that kind of pressure and decision making when there's conflict is taken out of the specific hands of that clinician. Um, do you have anything else you you think of that that you might want to add? Um, no, I think I think you've covered all of, of that Elspeth. I'm just I'm going to go to a different question um, from Pippa, which says that if um, a patient's surgery was delayed due to the pandemic and the consenting process occurred before March, and the operation is now taking place. Um, if their patient's condition has not changed, does the clinician need to do a physical re-examination before surgery? Um, I think obviously this is going to have to be um, considered on a, on a patient by patient basis. I, I think it would be important to have um, a discussion with the patient in those circumstances to ensure that if appropriate, they were informed of the, the additional risks now associated with COVID. Um, in terms of the, the physical re-examination, I think that that's a clinical decision and um, if the patient's condition hasn't changed then the clinician may take the decision that um, a physical re-examination is not necessary. Um, I would recommend that that decision be documented in the notes but like I say that there'll be an updated discussion in terms of um, any um, alteration in the, in the risk profile which is associated with um, COVID because that will now be relevant when it wasn't necessarily relevant when the consenting process occurred prior to March. And um, I think there's a second question that says, um, do you think courts will take the context of the pandemic into account when looking at consent conflicts? Um, yeah, I, I think that the court will do. Um, I believe that, that the law is flexible. Um, it's uh, applied, well, it will be applied um, reasonably. And I think that courts will inevitably have to consider the fact that clinicians are operating in a highly um, stressful and pressurised environment. And that I think um, that 
that will have to be taken into consideration when um, considering the material risks which need to be explained to a patient. But I think that um, thinking about it like this, if, if you tell a patient of um, the, the quite small risk of death, for example, associated with a general anaesthetic, that, that courts will, will likely find that a patient should also be informed of the risks associated um, with contracting um, COVID, especially if that patient falls into um, a higher risk category, for example, if they're a male patient over 70 or if they're from a, a black or ethnic minority background. There's a question as well in relation to, um, and this this is actually quite a sort of a common query, if there's a um, Montilla, um, sorry if I'm pronouncing your name incorrectly, if there is an unsuspected cancer diagnosis in surgery which has been delayed purely due to COVID and because there was no suspicion of cancer when it was planned, where do we stand? I think, what would you say, Jen, in relation to, to that um, scenario? So I think that that is going to be um, a cases that we are facing. Um, I, I think it will obviously um, need to, to be judged on um, the reasonableness test on whether the um, the, the care provided uh, was was reasonable, and I think the courts will have to take into consideration, like I say, whether it was reasonable to um, to delay the surgery um, at, at the time it, it was delayed. This is going to be an issue. I, I think we're just going to have to see um, how these cases pan out um, but like I say it will all go down to um, whether the decision to, to um, delay the surgery at the time that that was taken w w was reasonable. Okay I think, um, I think stuff like that will actually have um, uh, an impact on um, inquest because I also specialise in inquest law and in relation to looking at something that's not directly um, a cause of death that's not precisely COVID, aka um, natural, but actually um, was impacted by the COVID pandemic and they'll be looking into sort of the wider issues um, at that point in, a, in potentially a coronial inquiry. Brilliant. Um, so we don't want to, to keep you any longer, um, but thank you to everyone for attending today. Um, after the session, we will send a copy of the slides um, together with a feedback form. And it'd be really helpful if you could fill this out for us um, to ensure that we can, um, it, going forward in providing these sessions, we can, can fully um, uh, cover all the relevant issues. Um, we'll also send out a recording um, of the webinar. And I know a few of you have been asking about a certificate of attendance. Um, so I believe that if you do want a certificate, if you could just email us and let us know, then we can provide you with that. Um, so um, I just want to say thank you to everyone for attending on behalf of both Elspeth and I. Um, our contact details are on the, the final slide. So please do let us know if you um, have any questions and we'd be happy to, to deal with those. Oh, and also, um, Anne, just uh, I've noticed your sort of follow up. So um, I'll separately message in answer to your question. Um, but thank you for everyone for their um, contributions and uh, questions. And we do appreciate, I've seen Betsy say, um, staff are on their knees at the moment with the burdens. And we do understand that. Um, so, yes, thank you very much.